The art of eating was passed down from the original animal ancestor to all its descendants. But exactly what and how that ancestor ate remains mysterious. Maybe it snagged tiny organisms that got stuck in its pores, like the peripherans, the sponges, or swallowed their prey and then liquefied it to circulate through their body with a canal system like a nutritious smoothie, a la tenophores. Mmm. We can look to these early diverging animals for clues. But we know from the metazoan ancestor evolved all the feeding mechanisms and adaptations that we see in today's animals. Now, there are animal eaters, plant and fungi eaters, and both eaters, but also wood eaters, bone eaters, and decaying things eaters, each of which requires a suite of adaptations to turn food into nutrients and energy. Animals evolved to eat a lot of different things, even stuff that barely passes for food, and it shapes our entire lives, from what we look like to where we live. So grab a snack, because today's episode is going to make you hungry. Well, until we start talking about what happens to food after you've digested it. I'm Raywin Grant, and this is Crash Course Zoology. Along with moving, sexually reproducing, and having multiple cells, eating is one of the key traits we inherited from the original animal ancestor, and part of the very definition of what makes something an animal. Specifically, animals are ingestive heterotrophs, which means we engulf food with our bodies and don't make it from non-living sources. Like, I would love to gobble up some fettuccine alfredo right now, but my little desk succulent would prefer to make its own food by absorbing sunlight, carbon dioxide, and a hint of water. Of course, even though fettuccine alfredo is delicious, I admit it might not be for everyone. So to better understand how animals live, we're interested in two major things. What animals eat and how they eat it. Both what and how have changed and expanded over time as more animals and food sources have developed. One of the oldest diets is carnivory, or eating other animals. Animal eating animals, like those tenophores we mentioned that liquefy their prey, probably evolved long before plant-eating animals. One piece of evidence for this is that if we consult the animal tree of life, the common ancestors of many phyla are carnivores, which means that animals in those groups likely came from animal eaters. Plant eaters only show up within the phyla later. In fact, animals could have been eating other animals for over 600 million years, which means carnivory developed many millions of years before plants even existed on land. Though there could have been some plant eaters in the oceans. Today, about 63% of animals are carnivores, according to a 2019 study by scientists at the University of Arizona. Which might be surprising considering there are lots of plants around, and plants don't run away or fight back. Usually. Herbivory, or eating plants and fungi, requires a new set of adaptations to eke out calories and to turn plant cells into animal cells, like flat teeth and special organs called gizzards to grind them up, specialized gut bacteria to demolish the tough cellulose and plant cell walls, and a lot of time to chew, rechew, and digest huge volumes of food. It's easier to be a carnivore. Carnivores get a lot of energy from one serving, and more easily get protein and fats from their diet. And their intestines push food through more quickly because they can get away with being less efficient at extracting nutrients. About 32% of animals are herbivores, according to that same 2019 study. And 3% are animals like bears, crows, and us humans who use omnivory, or eating both plants and animals. Having a flexible diet sounds like a bright idea, but it's kind of a catch-22. Omnivores have lots of food options, but they also have to maintain a lot more biological machinery than animals that eat just one kind of thing. But it's the remaining 2% of animals that really push the definition of food. Beavers, shipworms, which are a type of clam, and insects like termites are xylophagers, or wood eaters, even though wood is a terrible food. It's almost entirely made of hard to break down cellulose and has very few nutrients and calories. So like more traditional herbivores, wood eaters have extra adaptations to get their calories, like their own cellulose-busting proteins. 
and some wood eaters cheat by sneaking other plant parts and fungi into their diet. But osteophagers take it a step farther and eat bone, which is pretty amazing when you consider that bone is basically biology's best impression of a rock. There's a fair amount of protein in bone marrow, so animals like bone worms, a group of deep sea polychaetes, secrete a bone dissolving acid out of their mouths to burrow into whale bones, where they find fats and proteins. Even some herbivores like giraffes and cows will chew on bones to add phosphate and calcium into their diet, minerals which are hard to come by in plants. Well, I'm not going to add wood and bone to my grocery list, but termites, bone worms, and others might have evolved such weird tastes because it can be advantageous to figure out how to eat something no one else can, even if it requires some bizarre eating habits. The animal menu has lots of options, but how do different animals stuff their faces? Or whatever they do to eat if they don't have a face? Even within one ocean, there's a huge variety in the way animals eat. Many whales, fish, barnacles, shrimp, jellyfish, and other animals, large and small, are filter feeders, which means they capture food suspended in water or air. In the ocean, filter feeders filter water, trapping relatively tiny bits of food in baleens, modified gills, feeding baskets woven with legs, or if you're a sponge, holes. Whether they let the food come to them or find places where tiny bits of food are plentiful, filter feeders don't bother with hunting any one target in particular. They just gulp in the general area and let the filters do their job. But there's a lot more to eat in the ocean than just tiny food particles. Filter feeding is a pretty simple strategy, so we see a huge variety of animals doing it. But to eat larger and more specialized food items, animals need to evolve a more specialized structure namely a head. Heads can be optional for filter feeders, but predators like octopuses, out there killing and consuming another organism to absorb its nutrients, need a head. They combine the sense organs that find food and the weaponry that clinches the food in one convenient package. Dolphins, comb jellies, bobbit worms, and other animal-eating carnivores are also definitely predators, but you don't have to necessarily be a carnivore to be a predator. Even dugongs, sometimes called sea cows, and other herbivores can be predators too. They're plant predators if they eat and kill the whole plant, or eat things that are future whole plants, like seeds. And then there are the animals that eat dead stuff. These are scavengers who wait for something else to do the killing before they dig into the carcass. And detritivores who eat bits of decaying plants and animals and their poop. And these garbage eaters are really important because they recycle nutrients through their animal communities so everyone can feed again. How animals eat can intersect in many ways with what they eat. Like predators can be herbivores, and scavengers can be carnivores or bone-eating osteophagers. And you might start out eating one thing one way and completely change over time, whether it takes millions of years or just a lifetime. One mode of feeding we haven't talked about yet is parasitism, which is a special kind of predation. Entomologist E.O. Wilson put it best, calling parasites predators that eat prey in units of less than one. Just hitch a ride on or in your host and nibble at them forever. We'll get you hooked on parasites in a later episode, but as a little appetizer, let's experience a day in the life cycle of a parasitic filter feeding bloodsucker. Allow me to introduce the sea lamprey, or Petromyzin marinus, a creature so evolutionarily ancient it diverged from other fish before they developed jaws. And fish have had jaws for a long time, about 500 million years. Until about 80 years ago, it was impossible to find a sea lamprey here in Lake Michigan. But this lamprey's enterprising great-great-great-grandparents found their way inland as human workers widened and deepened shipping canals in the Great Lakes region. And ever since, generations of sea lamprey like this one have feasted on trout, whitefish, and other smallish lake fishes, latching onto them with their sucker mouth filled with hooks like ancient vampires. 
This sea lamprey is so large compared to the lake fish and causes so much blood loss and damage that they act more like a predator than a parasite in the Great Lakes ecosystem. But once the sea lamprey has grown large and become a mature adult by feasting on nutrient-rich fish blood, she'll migrate upstream to lay eggs. She won't live to see her larvae grow up or make sure they get enough to eat. But lamprey larvae can take care of themselves. They're filter feeders, snacking on tiny plants, microbes, and other junk that they trap in mucus in their throat. Eventually, these lamprey larvae develop into parasitic juveniles, moving downstream in search of the big, tasty prey that nourished their parents years before. Their whole digestive system shuts down for months as they turn into a vampire and shift from a detritivore to a parasitic carnivore. Once that's done, they can really take advantage of the benefits of feasting on flesh as they mature and get ready to have their own larvae. It's a circle of lamprey life. Sea lampreys show how easily animals can flip between filter feeder, parasite, and predator based on their life stage and ecological context. They also show what and how an animal eats, whether it's tiny scraps or the finest fish in the Great Lakes, has a huge influence on other parts of the animal's life, like how it looks and acts. But regardless of how they get it, all animals have to digest or break down the engulfed food in small molecules that can be absorbed by the body. And then, well, it's poop. We're talking about poop. After the food is digested, waste excretion, which is like taking out the biological trash, is essential. Otherwise, all the bits that animals can't eat build up some of which are quite toxic. Simple, tiny animals, like placozoans and rhombozoans, get rid of their carbon dioxide and ammonia waste by just pushing it out through their cell membranes and into the environment. More complex animals have a lot more cells, so they have dedicated systems for liquid waste excretion, which can be stuff like uric acid, urea, or ammonia, depending on the animal's diet and biology. Then there's the solid stuff, which can be made up of things that didn't get completely digested, like cellulose, mucus, and bacteria. We have to get rid of it at some point, but some animals vary the timing. Like eyelash mites don't poop at all. Instead, they store all their waste in their bodies until they die, which is after only a few weeks. While this may seem like a horrible and gross adaptation, a few weeks is enough for the mites to grow and reproduce, and they don't need to use any energy to grow an excretory system. And they're super successful. Basically, every human has little poop-filled mites on their skin. So just like there's a range of what and how animals eat, there's a whole lot of ways for them to get rid of it too. So to some extent, we are what we eat, Eating is a fundamental trait to being an animal that's been passed down from the earliest metazoans. And the food animals choose and how they engulf it dictate their role in the environment and even how successful they and their descendants will be. Next time, we'll talk about a body system that makes you feel hungry and the head honcho that coordinates just about everything else in an animal body, the nervous system and brains. Thanks for watching this episode of Crash Course Zoology, which was produced by Complexly in partnership with PBS and Nature. It is shot on the Team Sandoval Pierce stage at Porchlight Studios in Santa Barbara, California, and made with the help of all of these nice people. If you'd like to help keep Crash Course free for everyone forever, you can join our community on Patreon.